Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast, your weekly dose of knife news and information about knives and knife collecting. Here's your hosts, Jim Person and Bob the Knife Junkie DeMarco. Hello, fellow Knife Junkie, and welcome to episode number 108 of the Knife Junkie Podcast. I'm Jim Person. And I'm Bob DeMarco. Welcome to the show. Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast. It is the place for knife newbies and knife junkies to learn about knives and knife collecting. Hear from knife designers, makers, manufacturers, reviewers, anyone who loves knives, you know you're in the right place with the Knife Junkie Podcast. And Bob, today's uh, interview show, an interesting guest, a uh, knife designer maker. Uh, Yes, uh, we're talking to John Gonzalez of Dervish Knives. And Dervish Knives is a... um, an outfit I came across a few years back when I was first starting to get interested in uh, less production-y, more, uh, wow, people are making those knives, custom knives. And I came across him uh, for his fixed blades, uh, dervish knives. They're they're an incredible blend of, of sort of ancient weapon of war meeting modern day uh, field knife and uh that was my first intro into him, and then I started to open up his catalog and see he uh, that he he does folders and all of these great knives, and they all have a, a a design language that really speaks to me, and it all comes back to the Ricasso area. Uh, I think we talk a little bit about that, but these are beautiful, classy knives, and this is a this is a uh, a gentleman who's a graphic designer. We've we've heard from a number of people who have gone from graphic design or art, you know, two dimensional art into knife making. And, and, uh, I love that cause that's my background. And of course I, I would like that to be my future. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. So, uh, John Gonzalez, great guy uh, to talk to. And I was very happy to finally meet the man behind those beautiful designs. Yeah. I found that, uh, that part of it interesting as well. The graphic design, uh, kind of an interesting story right off the bat, how we went from that into making knives. So, uh, yeah. Yeah. And people couldn't see it, but while we were interviewing, he, he, uh, was in his shop. Uh, because he wanted to show off a couple of knives that uh, I had told him I loved uh, in a phone conversation beforehand. But in the background was a lot of his two-dimensional work. And it was just really uh, cool to see all that stuff up on the wall. Well, let's uh, get into that interview. John Gonzalez with Dervish Knives. And that's coming up next on episode 108 of the Knife Junkie podcast. Do you use terms like handle the blade ratio, walk and talk, hair pop and sharp, or tank like? Then you are a dork. And a knife junkie. John Gonzalez of Dervish Knives, I want to thank you for coming on the Knife Junkie podcast. Well, thanks for having me. It's an honor. Uh, it's it's a pleasure. It's a pleasure to have you here. Uh, we've spoken on the phone a couple of times uh, leading up to this, and uh, something occurred to me uh, during our last conversation, which is there there are some knife designs or knife designers whose work uh, just resonates on, on a level that doesn't require thought. Uh, you just see it. It looks great. Uh, I have a long list, uh, not so long list of knife makers like that. You're one of them. Uh, the other kind is the kind that requires a little bit of thought. Mm, I guess you could use it for this, this or that, or I see why this is a challenging design. So to me, your designs, your dervish knives had an appeal the instant I saw them. What what got you into this? What is your um, you know, what's your background and how did you end up in knives? Well, my, my background is in, in art and in, in graphic design and illustration. I was at the time uh, when I got into uh, the knife gig, I was doing uh, websites for the most part. And uh, I was really into this guy, Ted Frizzell of Mineral Mountain Hatchet Works, his work. He makes these really crazy cool uh you know, user Bowie knives and fighting knives and stuff. And they were, you know, for custom made knives, they were at a really good price point. But it was always a real pain in the butt to get a hold of them because he didn't have a website and he had like a print order catalog. This is in the late nineties now, you know, so, and you'd have to try to get him on the phone to place the order. And, you know, I was bugging him. Come on, Ted, let's do a website. You need a website. I'll make one for you, you know? And, uh, he, he, he was, he was really into the show circuit at the time, doing knife shows, doing gun shows. He was like, no, John, I don't need a website. And, uh, eventually I talked him into it. And I, so I, you know, basically what, what was, he said he didn't want to have to deal with it. He didn't want to have to deal with orders from the website. So he gave me a cut of all sales and I handled his orders for him for a little while. And right away I started getting the itch to design knives. And, uh, I was, 
I was messing with, I, I would modify knives. I would take off the scales and put on, you know, fancier wood scales and make a leather sheath and all that. And uh, so I started asking them, can you do uh, knife blanks uh, to my specs? You know, you know, grind and heat treat these things and I could put handles on them and make sheaths for them. And he agreed to that. And that's kind of where Dervish Knives was born. They were initially collaboration knives between Ted and I. And right away, you know, I mean, I was working the handles and doing the, 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 the sheaths, but I right away had the itch to do more, you know. And so it wasn't long after that started, I started learning the craft myself. And uh, I had, you know, for a period of time, there was two lines of Dervish Knives. There was the Ted and John collaboration knives, and there were the you know, John Gonzalez custom knives. And uh, so that was going on for a couple of years. And eventually I just was, it was kind of confusing. People didn't really know what they were getting sometimes. And I decided to phase out the collaboration stuff and just go full bore into it. So while you were doing the collaborations, uh, were you learning along the way how to actually do it? I mean, you're an artist, so maybe you have some sense of sculpture and reductive art like that. Were you learning the machines and the pro- uh, processes along the way? Yeah. I mean, I, I had no machine background. I mean, I've always been handy. I've always liked working with my hands and, and tools. But like as far as working metal, I, I was kind of a beginner. And so it was just sort of a, you know, one of those things. I, I actually practiced grinding and for months and months before I finished a knife. Because of the, uh, you know, the recommendations from other knife makers like Tom Mayo back in the early days when um uh, like the, you know, the usual, the, the USN, uh, the, in, in the knife maker section, there was all these awesome knife makers who would readily give you, you know, help learning the craft. And, uh, a lot of them said, don't even worry about finishing a knife. Just learn how to grind, you know, for, for a long time. And it took me a long time to, to be able to make a decent grind. So it was kind of a, a long process. It just sort of evolved. And I never planned on being a folder maker. I only wanted to make fixed blades. And eventually that, you know, kind of seep in as well. Well, so when I when I first discovered you, just uh, going down some rabbit hole on the internet years ago, you were only fixed blades at the time, uh, and and then you started to introduce the the folders. How how did that need grow in you to to take to take it to the mechanical level? Well, it's it's always been about doing what I like, you know. So I made fixed blades that appeal to me, um, and when I started seeing these. You know, there was the late 90s, early 2000s was a great time to be a knife maker. There was so much cool stuff coming out and all these amazing guys were doing really innovative work. And so I was inspired by what I was seeing. And, you know, I had all these guys who were bugging me. You got to do a folder. You got to do a folder. And I I didn't really want to do it. And eventually, with the help of some knife maker friends, you know, and, you know, Bob Terrazola's book, uh, I learned, learned how to do it. And it's, you know, as far as I'm concerned, Making folding knives isn't evolving. I'm still learning. You know, there's there's always something to learn with making frame lock or, or liner lock. Um, but yeah, I mean, it was just one of those things that evolved. One of the things I I am uh, I love swords. I love fixed blades. I love big giant you know bowies and and those kind of things. I also love large folders, and I love uh, the ability to take something. You know, you can't. Uh, walk around in civilized society these days with a big Bowie, unless you want to be one of those guys, you know, but you can take a, a sizable folding knife with you and, uh, you know, have it out of sight. But, you know, people can still know it's there if they see this, the clip. I love that about folders. That's that's where where uh, I really turn the corner um, when my fixed blade collecting kind of got, uh, I don't want to say out of hand, but I was like, I need more. I need to like have these on me all the time. Well, they do fold, you know, and that was right. kind of back in the, in the, in that, uh, time you're talking about the late nineties, uh, when I discovered Emerson knives, I was like, Oh my God, this is possible. Yeah. I mean, and that's, you know, my approach when I initially, when I decided to make uh, my first folder, when I designed my first folder, it was from the standpoint of I wanted this folder to be as much like a fixed blade as possible. And really, my biggest inspiration at the time, for, certainly with folders, um, but just the knife making in general, was Strider knives and mixed Strider. Mm-hmm. And uh, you know, I wanted something that was going to be rock solid and and big enough to do most tasks. And uh, you know, something that would perform almost like a like a, a fixed blade would. So that was my first. The Nephilim, that was my, my goal with that knife was to do that. That knife it has a, 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 
just a little bit over four. It's like a four and a quarter inch blade, I think. And it's a, it's a, is that, and that, it's got a compound grind. Am I right? And it's, it's sort of a recurve tanto kind of. Right. Um, it's exactly right. Um, it evolved over time. It initially wasn't a compound grind. Once I learned to do compound grinds, that's all people wanted <laughs> with that knife. But yeah, it's got, it's almost, it's kind of similar to the, you know, the Ursa minor, the Ursa major, that sort of recurve with the spear point, um, crazy compound grind deal. All right. So as you know, uh, you know, I've, I've, I've professed my love for the Ursa major, but actually when we we're talking, it's the minor that I want. I want them both, but it's the minor that I want for the, you know, the bedside knife. It's a little more manageable. Um, that shape, that, that recurve, I don't know how you would characterize that shape. It, it, it reminds me of an, an ancient weapon of war. It's obviously a very modern design when you look at it, but it, it has these cues of, of, uh, ancient, ancient warfare and and you carried that into the nephilim and then i've i've been watching how the folders have evolved but i just want to step back the inspiration for your first knives for your fixed blade knives where did where did that inspiration come from well i i've I've always been a student of history and especially military history and i I love you know ancient arms Uh, ever since i was i was a kid i was obsessed with swords and pole arms and daggers and axes and all that stuff and so I think, you know, I initially the, 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 the impulse is to recreate these, these sorts of weapons. But, um, you know, certainly, you know, just coming at it from a design background, I would look at, you know, say a clip point Bowie knife and, you know, how can I apply my own sort of design sensibility to it, but yet still retain the functionality of the intended purpose of that knife, you know? And then, of course, just looking at all the awesome, other these other knife makers out there who are just doing really cool stuff you can't help but be uh, inspired by them you know you try really hard not to emulate anybody and to uh, you know develop your own style but you know i think you any any knife maker who says they haven't borrowed from other knife makers or the, the makers have come before them um you know i don't i think they're lying <laughs> well you're acutely aware of that as an artist and someone who came up through two-dimensional art i mean we're all standing on the shoulders of giants when it comes to art you know we wouldn't be where we are without the people who came before us and you could say that about anything and any you know any time so uh it's the weapon thing it's the it's the you walk into an art museum in the first room you go to before you go to the things you really should go to uh is the arms and armament room and is that is that does that nail it for you oh absolutely i mean you know and and to be fair this was I, you know, I, I'm not, I've got, I still have the books and everything. I'm still very much interested in this, but sort of what, what I'm building off of is my, you know, adolescent teen uh, obsession with this stuff, you know? Uh, but yeah, certainly if I, if I'm in a, that's the first room I go to. Sure. Okay. So your, your one inspiration is, um, is Mick Strider and the, and the, and the Strider knives and how they're built. So after the Nephilim, you start doing some frame lock folders. Right. Uh, you do the uh, the Navajo. Is that first? Is that what came first? Uh, yeah, I think you're right. Um, well, there was there was. Let's see. Did the Comanche come first or was it the Navajo? I, I can't remember. Um, I know there were some prototypes that came before the Comanche for sure. Mm-hmm. I think what happened is I think it was the Comanche, which is the sort of stubby fat folder. And then I wanted to do a Comanche XL, which is a little more um, traditionally proportioned. And it's, you know, and I, in fact, I think I called it the Comanche XL and I was like, you know, it's, it's kind of its own thing. So I named it the Navajo. Okay. Okay. So uh, as a, uh, a guy who's now making, you know, you have multiple uh, folders. What do you find sells the most? I personally love three and a half plus. I love a four inch blade is like ideal for me because I think, uh, I, I really started paying attention to folding tactical knives when they were all kind of four inches and I sort of, keyed in then and then they've kind of gotten smaller and then edc became a thing and um so to you what what are you seeing are your most popular models the most the, the most popular sizes what and and does that affect how you design stuff um yeah you know honestly as far as folding knives go well i think that there's probably a, l- a little bit more demand for the bigger stuff at least you know three and a half inch to four inch um i i haven't done a like a mid-tech run of uh, well, I did the, the Navajo EDC, which is a little over three inches. They all seem to sell pretty well. You know, the, the interesting thing is my fixed blades seem to sell 
as well or better than my folders, which I think is very unusual um, for a knife maker. Usually, they once they get into folders, people stop ordering them. And mm. uh, but you know, for custom knives, I think I probably do make more XL alchemies than anything. You know, that's the four inch version. Yeah. So you just came out with a new run of those with a special presentation that I saw on Instagram. Tell me about that. So, yeah, you know, I did the first uh, run of Alchemy XLs. I had done previous runs of, of Alchemies. They were sort of a midsize version. And uh, these ones, I, you know, I did a, a, a standard drop. And one of my, my buddies and sort of helper, Dervish Knives, Mike, he had an idea for doing a special run for the tribe. The Dervish Tribe, which is it's the you know, kind of the fan club or whatever, mm-hmm. and you know dedicated uh, cu- you know Dervish fans. So he had all these ideas. I mean, he he said, "Well, how about a cool texture, you know, in the in the frame of the handles?" So I start. I got you know this guy to um, guy does really nice laser work. Do this texture pattern on the handles, and then Mike had the idea for um, these books and so it looks like a like a book and you open it up and it's, it's a false book with an insert where the alchemy xl sits inside and it's got this engraved dervish logo and it's it's really tricky he, he came up with this idea him and his buddy bought a 3d printer just to make these inserts for, for this project which is crazy um so cool. but they're awesome they, i i can i can you know say that they're really super cool because i had nothing to do with it i don't i wouldn't be arrogant to say that um <laughs> but people seem to like them well, uh, to me, it harkens back to, um, uh, you know, back in the day, I used to think that every gentleman had a book in his study uh, that had a gun <laughs> stashed away just in case, you know, and it, <laughs> right. it, it, it kind of taps into that, that sort of thing. You know, you open the book and then, oh my gosh, it's not, uh, you know, it's not war and peace. It's a knife. Right. I, yeah, I, and the, I love that. Yeah, true. And the other thing is it kind of keeps with the alchemy theme. You know, like when I take pictures, I tend to use like old alchemy drawings and stuff. And these look like old books, you know, like, you know, it's some some sort of hermetic study or something, you know, with the, yeah. with the, the book, the, the knife hidden inside it. So how do you how do you come up with the names alchemy? Uh, how do you come up with the names for these? Um, you know, initially I was I would try to name things, uh, you know, mythological, use mythological names. Um, at some point, you know, with, with the Comanche and Navajo, I thought it was a good idea to, I, I was, I was really into, I was reading all these books on Western Southwest history, you know, frontier history. And I was, you know, I had these, this whole, uh, you know, war between the, the native Americans and, and sort of the expansion West fresh in my mind when I was designing these. And that's just how I named them kind of off the cuff. The thing is, a lot of times I come up with these names and it's like I'm posting pictures and I'm like, what am I going to call it? And I just blah, and I just <laughs> type it out. And, nice. and now it sticks and it's stuck. You know, in retrospect, I probably would change some of these names. But uh, yeah, I mean, I, you know, honestly, a whole lot of thought doesn't really go into it. I mean, the alchemy, I could come up with all kinds of cool ideas, but really, I just thought it was a neat idea. Um, you know, you know, the, the, the changing of uh, lead into gold, I guess, you know, so you're taking, you know, this. Uh, raw bar stock and you're turning it into some refined yeah. tool, you know, and I could, <laughs> but really it just, I look kind of like the name. Yeah. And it's got a little bit of mystery to it and a little, yeah. Uh, so then, so then you've also been doing recently, you did these, you don't call them these, uh, but they're scalpels. They look like little scalpels, little EDC fixed blades. And I love EDC fixed blades. I, uh, I carry them every once in a while. I always have a neck knife on uh, behind my work badge. Uh, fits there nicely. And, uh, and, uh, you know, uh, I go in and out of phases where I will EDC a fixed blade. And usually it's, it's, it's bigger than something in my pocket just because, uh, I don't think the, the fixed blade should be ignored every day like it is. Right. Uh, but tell me about that little scalpel. It, it, it's a, it looks like a sweet, perfect little companion. Yeah. So thank you. That's, that's called the worm, W Y R R M. And, uh, that, <sighs> For I, it's sort of the older brother of the, this um, this line of knives I used to make called the Silverfish, and they started off as these little one-off mini mini knives, you know, one and a half inch, two inch blades with a little two finger handle on them, and they were just little hideaway knives. And uh, I could do them; they were quick and easy to make, and I would sort of do, you know, do them as one-offs and throw them up for sale. And and eventually, I started doing runs of those as well, but. Um, I guess over the years, people, you know, I'd see, I've seen other knife makers doing uh, Kickstarter runs and I had people 
you know, recommending I do it myself. And I was, you know, I, if I'm going to do a Kickstarter run, I want it to be something kind of unique, something different for me and, uh, you know, something outside of the box, at least, you know, for Dervish Knives. And, uh, so I had, I, you know, went through my, my sketchbooks and I found this old drawing and, uh, did a little tweaks to it. And I was like, this will be neat because it'll have a, a low price point, uh, relatively speaking. And, uh, you know, so maybe we can get a bunch of people onto this thing. And it was a very successful Kickstarter campaign, uh, as far as I'm concerned, sold a whole bunch of them. And, uh, yeah, people seem to like them. They're, they're pretty, like, kind of handle, like, like you said, like a scalpel. Um, I used to, I, I at first was referring to them as a pen knife because it almost feels like a pen in your hand or something. Oh, yeah. It's a fine, you know, like a fine detail work, uh, knife. But, uh, yeah, that's how it came about. That's funny because I've been doing a lot of uh, helping cut out construction paper, uh, you know, being a homeschooler right now. And I've been going to all my Warncliffe blades and they're all great in one way or another, but they're all lacking in in how you hold them when you're cutting out little fine butterflies and stuff out of construction paper. You want something a little right. bit more like a scalpel. Yeah. Or like an exacto knife, right? Or, or a pen. Yeah. That you can hold yeah. like a pen. Yeah. So yeah, that was exactly. kind of the, 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 so are you expecting to do more like what is your your model and your structure i I know you make you hand make knives in your shop and then you have mid-tech lines but you're also exploring different things like this uh or different ways of of doing it like uh like a kickstarter campaign and that kind of thing what's your uh what's your business model well i'm kind of flying by the seat of my pants here (laughs) you know no i mean it's not my back, I got a huge backlog on my, on my custom orders books. And that's sort of a long story in and of itself. I, I kind of, I kind of blew it with that and, and took way too many people on uh, the last time I opened my book. So I got a giant log jam of years and years backlog. And, um, what I found what was happening is, um, people were, you know, they go to try to buy something for me and my books are closed and they would move on. And people tend to ignore you if there's no reason to look at, you know, why even bother pay attention to dervish knives if you can't get anything from them? Yeah. So I've been trying to focus on the mid tech stuff and have those as you know these batches that you know I can produce with you know relatively little effort on my part. You know I outsource a lot of this you know most of the work on on these things, and uh, so I can I can sell a batch of my designs that I'm putting my hands on all of them and, and you know going through all of them, but they're still like you know it's not tying me down as a full time job, and I can kind of do both at the same time. Now, going forward, the intention is to try to do uh, bigger runs of these mostly because, mm-hmm. you know, what I found is my mid-tech runs, if I do a batch of 50 mid-tech runs, they sell out really quickly. And, you know, that that makes people uh, unhappy because they're not, you know, on social media or whatever all the time so they can jump on these things. And it's also kind of like shooting myself in the foot because, you know, I can be making more money if I sell more of these things. So. So that's the plan going forward is to try to beef up the, the production runs a little bit, maybe try to mix it up. You know, I've got so many models that I want to do as mid-techs and, you know, just, you know, just, just in, in, you know, knives that I've, I've already produced as customs, but also in just designs. I've got sketchbooks full of designs. Uh, that's actually really good to hear from the perspective of someone like myself who, uh, you know, pretty much everything you you design, everything I see on your website, I'm like, I would love that. I would love that. I would love that. <laughs> and, uh, you. you know, uh, to you're welcome. But but to bring that into within reach, uh, it's an interesting point. You know, you know, if 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 something is so totally uh, beyond reach because there are so few of them and you just can't get them. Uh, yeah, people will move on. It's that's an interesting thought. And if you have sketchbooks full it's about the design in a lot of sense. There will, there will be the people who always want your hands touching, uh, touching the knife. There will always be people who want you to make it from the ground up and they'll stick around. But for people who are, uh, uh, um, you know, exploding into the hobby or just happen to, ha- you know, be on a tear buying knives and oh my God, this design, this is awesome to, to have something that they could drop a couple hundred bucks on at the moment. And by a couple, I'm not, I'm not presuming to be pricing your knives, but I mean, um, to have something that is possible to just like, you know, who amongst us, uh, who among, amongst us hasn't had a couple of beers and then made a purchase. And you're like, oops, I just bought up. <laughs> oh, gee, you know, so, right. um, to, to make that possible, I think that's a great idea. Yeah. Thanks. Um, you know, there's, there's a part of me that <clears throat> gets a little nervous in 
you know, going straight from a design to a mid tech run, you know, mm-hmm. I, I need to prototype it first at a minimum. But yeah, I mean, I think, you know, when you've got, I'm, I'm a one man shop, you know, and even my mid techs are, you know, if one guy, my, my buddy Keith is doing all the machining for me. And so it's really two people making these knives. Um, and, you know, so it, and when I've got all these ideas and only, you know, so much, uh, time and, and ability to, to make these, I think it makes sense to, to reach out, you know, a lot of guys, there's people who do that for a living. They design knives for, for companies. So yeah. I don't see what's wrong with, you know, pushing that on my end. Oh, there's nothing wrong, man. If, if, if that is something you can do, oh my gosh, I wish I could just send sketchbooks to companies. Oh, make, make these all. There's, there's That's a great. thing, you know, you're, you're in a good spot from, from the way I see it because, uh, you have a design language. I, I can, I can identify your knives pretty much. I mean, I don't, I'm not going to say I can do that straight across the board. Uh, but you have, there, there are certain things that first attracted me to your des- designs. And I've mentioned this to you before, but that sort of Spanish notch up by the, up by the Ricasso, you know, right by the Quillian, you, you have that in your, in a number of your fixed blades and that carries into a number of your folders. And to me, that's like, that's a, that's a through line, you know, in your designs. And, and the ones that don't have that particular thing share other design cues with other aspects of knives that do have it. And so I, I feel like your knives are identifiable. And I think that's a good position to be in if you plan on, um, you know, going further down the mid tech route. Now, in terms of like OEM manufacturing, that kind of thing, there, there is uh, obviously we and Riot, they're excellent and best tech and they, they're producing amazing things. There are also, uh, there are also several in this, in this country, uh, Alliance. I'm not sure if they actually design. But there's, uh, there's millet knives and, uh, uh several other, uh, OEMs. Is, is that something you would do? Uh, you would prototype it yourself in your shop, make one or two, send the design to, to someone that you trust and then have them make a, a bunch? That's certainly something I would, I would consider. Um, and I don't, I don't want to open up a can of worms, but, um, I probably, I'm, I'm trying to avoid, uh, the overseas made knives if at all possible. Not that I have anything against them personally, you know, it's just my own. I would much rather give this work to, uh, U.S. manufacturers. Um, and I know Millet is, is, is for sure making knives here. Uh, I would certainly consider that, but I think, feel like, you know, my mid tech runs, uh, you know, maybe if I expand, uh, that, uh, the, the manufacturing capabilities a little, maybe have somebody help me assembling stuff. Okay. I, I am more inclined to want to push my mid tech line than to go into full on uh, production. Uh, that's on the other, you know, I should say this Blade Runner systems, BRS. I don't know if you're yeah. familiar with them. Yeah. yeah. They, they do a lot of, uh, Bali songs, you know, uh, butterfly knives. And, uh, they approached me a while back. They wanted to do one of my models. And so they're, they're going to be doing a Navajo EDC full production knife. Sweet. In and, their BRS and, line. Yeah. Well, they've yeah. got the, it's, 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 uh, the BRS, uh, Darn it, they're going to kill me. I can't remember. Evolution, maybe? Or Evolution. Evolve? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Rev- yeah. yeah. Um, oh, God. Now everything you're saying, I'm like, yes, it's that. No, I know exactly <laughs> what you're talking about. Yeah. Evolve, I think. BRS Evolve. So anyways, they're, they're going to be doing a Navajo EDC. I was actually expected, expecting it to be done by now, but I think uh, those knives are made overseas, and uh, I know that those are uh, probably coming up, coming down the pipe here pretty soon. Okay. Couple of, okay, wait, uh, before I nerd out on a few more models of yours that I want to talk about in particular, let's just remind listeners and remind me because I, I'm starting to conflate mid tech with OEM. Describe, uh, what mid tech means when we say that. Well, and I, I probably should, should get this out in the open, what mid tech means to me, right? Yeah, Cause sure. I mean, I yeah. think it's, it's still something that we're trying to get a hold on. I don't think that my definition is necessarily going to be other people's definitions. Um, but, uh, for me, it means I'm outsourcing, um, some quantity of the labor, specifically CNC machining for the most part, but also things like, uh, commercial stone washing and that kind of thing. And again, I've got one guy I work with. He does, he does all this stuff in the shop. Um, so that's for, for you know, mid techs, it's like, you know, he, he's buying the material directly. He's, cutting out the parts, he's machining the bevels, he's machining the handle scales for me, and he sends them to me. And I do, depending on the model, you know, sometimes it's a good amount of work that goes into these, fitting locks and adjusting locks and detents and, and cleaning up scales and frames and 
you know, doing summary finishing and that sort of thing to, you know, like with these Ursa majors, they, man, they just came out great uh, directly from them. I don't have a lot to do. I'm, I'm hmm. adjusting the profiles and sharpening them and, and, you know, doing a little, little things here and there, but it's, you know, I'm not really doing much of them. So, so when we say mid tech, we're referring to, to uh, a knife that's been, um, who, whose component parts have been roughly uh, to, to, to whatever degree cut out or, uh, created by someone else to your specs. And then you're, you're, you're finishing it all and assembling it all and tuning it and getting it, turning it into a knife. You're basically having someone else do the, the grunt work of cutting out the stuff. Yeah, you know, so you're outsourcing a certain portion of the of the, of the, the labor. Way and, better uh, way of saying it. Way better way. <laughs> yeah. So, Thank you. Um, but you know, again, I, you know, I, I think there's, I, you know, you hear rumors, you know, they're about people outsourcing from, you know, their shop, having a certain way. Certainly, even year, you know, years and years ago, everybody got their stuff water jet cut. You know, you got mm-hmm. your blanks water jet jet cut. Um, you know, because it's 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 silly to be on the bandsaw when you're cutting cutting things out um, by hand, and it certainly is still a, com- a custom knife. And I think though, so though I think the, the lines get blurred a little bit. I think some people are having some stuff machined uh, out of shop, and then you know doing X, Y, and Z once it gets back in, and it's they're calling it a custom knife. Um, you know, I don't I don't have any uh, bone to pick there. I'm just you know sort of offering that as. Uh, uh, an observation of you know this all these definitions are sort of fluid and, and and evolving over time right right yeah i know that 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 was a that, it's always been kind of a slippery thing but i to me it makes sense if you're if you're going to try and make a go at a business you know it, it's nice to have the romantic like each each and every piece here was painstakingly and lovingly cut out you know by these hands well you're going to be in the poorhouse in no time uh, you know it's a great way for a uh for a, 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 a millionaire gentleman to make a knife, but, but, you know, someone who wants to make a go at a business, it, to me, it makes sense to have certain pieces made that take an incredible amount of time and busy work and that you just need to be regular and the same. If you're going to make a whole bunch of them, just cut out the, the damn G10 scales for me, please. And just make them right. fit just right, you know, to these specs. Why should you be doing that? Your, your, your hands and your, and your mind should be on design or on full customs, not on, Mm -hmm. you know, so anyway, I think it's a, it's an interesting thing. And, and that being said, you know, uh, I was having a conversation with my dad and he was like, these knife makers, how granular do they get with their parts? And I'm like, some people make their own screws. He's like, what? I'm like, yeah. And then, and then, Mm -hmm. and then some people, uh, you know, have, have pieces outsourced. Some people, like a certain aspect of the of the process and so focus on that and then have another aspect of the process that they're not so keen on taking care of by someone else why not what really matters is how good the knife is and what the design is in the end as far as i'm concerned that's true right you know with with my custom knives uh you know i'm getting my say on my alchemy models i have all those either water jet or, or cut out ahead of time so that i've got i've got a bin of just rough cut parts that I can tap into, you know, but some models I have nothing cut, you know, and I'm, 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 I'm cutting these things from scratch and every single one of my fixed blades is made from, from just a bar stock and a paper template that I, you know, I, I spray glue on there and cut out, you know, so there's, there's many different ways of skinning the cat. And, uh, you know, like you said, some of these guys are, they do, they make their own hardware, you know, and uh, more power to them. That's awesome. You know, and, and I, they get, I imagine they get a lot of money for them, either that or independently wealthy or. <laughs> yeah. Or, or it seems like maybe you get to a certain size in your operation and it makes sense to make your own screws and it makes sense to make everything. We're doing True. everything here. We bought these damn machines. We have the people who can program them. Let's do it all here. We know it'll fit. We won't have to worry about sending stuff back. Um, yeah. but, but maybe that's not for, for the one man shop. <laughs> right. Um, couple of models i want to talk to you about the sheba this was a couple of years ago now that you were doing that beautiful straight razory kind of four and a half inch fixed blade and then you also Mm -hmm. turned it into a folder i i love that knife you uh, another knife that came out maybe around the same time is long and slender four inch folder i don't remember the name of it it's got a recurve uh i could find it if i i I, i'm I'm sure you're familiar (laughs) i I think i know which one you're talking about um, yeah, the, so the Shiba was, the Shiba was that curvy fixed blade, uh, straight razor that, um, yeah. I came out with probably 15 years ago. Oh. And I made a handful of them 
for custom orders, but more and more as time goes on, people don't. They're not buying as as many uh, fixed blades as, as uh, folders in terms of custom knives. And for whatever reason, that was one of those models that, you know, I wasn't selling a lot of. And I would, you know, occasionally I'd post pictures and people would be like, oh, I love that you should do a mid-tech run. And, uh, and then something weird happened. Um, I, there was uh, another a knife maker out of Russia who, Russia who took my Shiba design and he made a folding knife out of it. And and it kind of irritated me because I was like, I want to do that. And he actually took photos of my knives, posted photos of my knives, and sort of engineered it to be a, uh, <laughs> a folder. And, uh, you know, and that's, that was a whole little bit of a drama thing. But anyways, that prompted me to, I'm going to do my own folder of this. And I did it. And, uh, you know, I just did a few customs and uh, just posted them for sale. And they seem to be popular. So, yeah, we're going to be doing a, a mid-tech run of those as well soon. And I think the other one you're talking about is the Arcana. The Arcana. We'll get to that in a second. But but I, yeah. I think I think over the last year and a half, I've I, I saw a number of these Shibas on Instagram because I had never seen them before, and to me it was a you know it was a definitely a different uh, look from you, but fit your language and and it made sense to me. Mm-hmm. I'm like, first of all, I mean, there's something universally appealing, I think, about a straight razor, and that's what that looks like to me. Uh, but mm-hmm. also, um, I, I thought it was a, a nice a nice way to sort of tap into the Warren cliff sheep sheep's foot kind of craze that, uh, I don't know, popped up five years ago. People started really, and, uh, you know, sax style blades, that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, it sort of kind of fit into that a little bit. Yeah. I mean, it's kind of got that Dow, uh, cleaver style blade yes, that was cleaver. really, it got very popular for a while. And, um, that was actually a reason why I almost, you know, wasn't, you know, disinclined to, to make, do the, uh, the folder version and certainly to think about doing a mid tech is because, you know, sometimes, you know, if things are too popular, it almost looks like you're trying to emulate them, like you're trying to copy oh, and just yeah. And I, that certainly wasn't the case. You know, this is an old design of mine, you know, mm-hmm. and it was just, it was just sort of happenstance that it, it came out that way. Um, but I'm glad to hear you like the design. I, I'm, I'm a fan of the Shiva. It's a nice curvy. It's got kind of sexy lines to it. Yes, yes. I, I think it's, uh, it's menacing and I, I love an, an element of menace in, uh, right. In knife designs. Cause that's always what brought me in. You know, that's what brought me in in the first place. Uh, the Arcana. Now that's a long, slender four inch knife. So it's, it's got, it sort of bucks the pop, what's popular right now. It's a little bit longer. Mm-hmm. Well, it's slender. People like that. It looks like it's very, very carryable. Um, so actually maybe what it is is the gateway four inch knife. Uh, for someone who can't handle something larger, <laughs> to me that's a that's a sneaky, slender, beautiful little knife. Tell me about the Arcana. Thank you. Um, yeah, I mean, that was Arcana was born out of desire to just try to do something that I thought. Here's the thing with with knife making now. You know, I'm relatively new to social media compared to most of my my, my knife making peers. But you know, you, what you, what I'm seeing is all these. There's so many talented knife makers out there. So many cool designs. And I really wanted to develop something that had a dirt that looked like a dervish, but also didn't look like any of my previous models and something that looked really kind of different, you know? And so I, I wanted it almost to look like one of those you know, old school trappers or whatever, but with a very sort of aggressive and dervishy feel. And, you know, that real slender, uh, almost scalpel like uh, handle, you know? So I, I just started putting pencil to paper and came up with that design and, it was one of those ones where I went, you know, I, I, I make a lot of, there's, I have a ton of designs that are just like, okay, that's okay. But, you know, I don't know if I want to, to, you know, follow through with it. When I, when I designed the Arcana, I was immediately happy with it, you know, and I thought this is going to be a cool life. There are some mechanical, uh, challenges to it because of it, because it's so, uh, slender, you know, that whole geometry of lock face, lock bar detent to pivot and stop pin and all that it's all really tight in there for, for a very bit large knife so there were some um challenges in there but once it got dialed in i love the design and, and that's another one that i have to do a mid-tech run at some point yeah yeah i would say so so who are, who are the people who are buying your knives what do you hear back from them do you do you get feedback from from your collectors and such i try to maintain a well Going back into the USN days, I, I sort of became a knife maker on the USN, and it was a very tight knit community. And 
I became friends with these guys. You know, so many of these people that are, were buying my knives, you know, not only customs in the early days, people around my books, but also people who will buy every single one of my mid -tags. They'll buy every patch. They'll buy every coffee mug or whatever I come out with. You know, they really support me. And you can't help but kind of like them just for that matter of fact, you know, because sure. they're, they're buying your stuff. But, you they're know, over, over the Right. And uh, but over the years, you kind of you, you tend to develop a relationship with these guys. And I, I, I have so many awesome, good, you know, really tight friends that, you know, were I was introduced via, you know, they were customers of mine. And um, so, yeah, I like to get feedback from them. You know, what do you want to see? Uh, what do you like? What do you, what do you not like? You know, some people, you know, I just, I was just thinking about these are some majors. They have a orange liner. And my buddy, uh, you know, customer and buddy, uh, Jose, who's also kind of helps me out on social media. He hates orange and here these things, these have orange liners on them and it's like, darn it. You know, so, um, but yeah, so, you know, I try to get feedback and, um, you know, you, you like to hear the good stuff. You like to hear once you do a batch of new text and they all get shipped out, you kind of hope that everybody will write back and, and say, Oh, this, this thing is awesome. Um, and you know, I do hear a lot of that, you know, and you occasionally hear something negative as well. And that's all good too, because you need to, you know, you need to, uh, to address things if, if they're things that need to be ironed out or, or maybe ignore them if it's not a valuable piece of criticism. You're an artist, you can take criticism and you, and you know how to assimilate the good stuff and, and make something better. And I think, uh, I mean, cause that's, that's part of what it is to go to art school is to get criticized and and sure. to defend your work and and to assimilate the good and and reject the bad and uh that's what uh that's what knife collectors like out of big companies and that's definitely what they want and like out of out, out of their boutique companies please forgive the 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 term but you're you know you're a small specialized mm -hmm. company and mm -hmm. uh but you know, whenever I see a big company nimble enough to 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 hear what the what the crowd is saying, and then a year or a season later, come out with with changes, you like to know that people are uh, are are not being prima donnas about it. Oh, this lock is sticking. I'll figure out how to fix it or whatever. I, I'm wondering. So I, I I was like, your fixed blades definitely have a martial uh, feel, kind of a military combat feel. Do you have any? feedback from people taking those out and banging, thrashing on them in military service or anything like that? Yeah. I mean, um, certainly martial artists and, and bladed weapons, aficionados, people who study the, the fighting arts, you know, those guys. Um, and not so much military, it doesn't seem like, you know, I mean, certainly I've, I've, I've made knives that have gone, uh, you know, overseas in the deployment and stuff, but, uh, you know, I don't recall anything off the top of my head uh, in terms of, uh, getting feedback from from military guys, but definitely you know like a friend of mine, Jason, he works for Triple Op Design. He is uh, an, an amazing martial artist, and he uh, knows bladed weapons. You know, he specializes in this stuff, so he's you know very eager to give me input on my stuff. You know, and <laughs> and and I'm very eager to get it get it get it as well from experts. You know, everybody has an opinion. Some some sometimes you get a, you get. Uh, directions from people that maybe okay well maybe that's good for another knife maker but it's not really what i want to do you know um so you gotta you know you you try to process it open-minded but but you also need to uh kind of do what suits you as well at the end of at the end of the day uh it's it's not surprising to me that you haven't heard from military guys because i've asked this question before and uh, my brother-in-law who's a former marine is like no one's gonna take their dervish knife for instance or their very expensive <laughs> knife you know, on deployment, it's going to get stolen like that. You know, <laughs> that's true. They're, they're going to take, you know, the, the the best that they can have and 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 sacrifice at the same time, and that's not going to be. Yeah, <laughs> I think you're right. Yeah, but but how cool would it look to see an Ursa Major kind of sideways mounted on a guy who's got the rest of the all the modern military gear on? I think it'd be super absolutely. Cool. <laughs> all absolutely. right, now now we're dipping back into my uh, into my adolescent uh, fantasies there. So, uh, what, what do you expect? Uh, how are you going to grow this company? You're an artist. Is, is this your, your one and only concentration or are you entrepreneurial? Uh, what, what do you, what do you see for the future of Dervish Knives? Well, you know, yeah, I mean, this is a full time gig for me. This is my life. I, I live and breathe knives and, uh, it's my focus. You know, I, I feel like I want to, I've long considered 
the notion of getting a CNC machine and learning that side of it. But I think at my age, I'm going to be 52 this year. And, um, you know, I don't, I don't, I, I, you know, I hopefully have a lot of years left, but, you know, I'm kind of comfortable doing it the way I'm doing it. I like using sort of a little more old school tools and machinery to, to make my custom knives. And I like outsourcing to people that I trust, uh, for the mid tech stuff to, to help me put out these batches of knives. And, um, you know, like I said, my guy Keith does a great job and I want to pursue that and, and try to kind of, Kick, bump up the the numbers a little bit as far as the mid techs go, and and continue to to do the the fill the custom orders and produce one offs and and you know see where it takes me. I love that. So so you're a uh, you're a pencil and paper guy when it comes to de- to designing, right? You know, I firm them up in, in CAD, but uh, yeah, yeah, but yeah, I mean they they all start off in, in a sketchbook with a pencil and paper. I I, I have uh, well, I don't have a knife company, but I do have books full of knife drawings that I would love to see made someday. And uh, to me, so I, I, I really relate to that. And uh, you and I in our disc- in our few phone discussions have ascertained we're of the same generation. And, and I can I can very much understand your desire to, to you know, to stay with what uh, with what feels real to you. To me, it's that's the same thing. It's, uh, you know, when you feel the pencil on the paper and you erase and you and you and you make that struggle there, I don't feel the struggle in the computer except uh, and of course, I've never done CAD uh, for knives I did CAD a long time ago, but I would feel the struggle in the interface, not in the design or in the artistic challenge. So it's yeah. interesting for me to hear you say that. Yeah, I mean, they for me, I, I've, I've tried to design a knife from scratch in CAD and it just it's not only the interface, but there's something about the, you know, when you're able to just quickly do a sketch, there's something about the energy and the mm-hmm. immediacy of putting, putting your, your ideas and thoughts and kind of correcting the curves really quickly. And, and, uh, for me, I, and I know a lot of guys design right in CAD. I can't do it. Oh, yeah. I mean, you look at Elijah Isham, uh, designs. They're, they're incredibly organic and, and crazy. Um, obviously he's a talent, uh, with CAD, to me, it's like what you're saying. It's that gesture, it's the energy that comes out of your body into the into the paper. And some people can yeah. translate that through a machine. But I, I love to hear. I don't know if you've ever seen uh, pictures of uh, Bill Harzi, but he's got a big drafting board and all these like pieces of paper and rulers and French curves, and that's how he designed. Cool. You know, legendary that's very guy. Cool. Still, yeah, I love that. I love that. Well, uh, John Gonzalez, tell everyone how they can find dervish knives and follow you and and admire your work buy your work get in touch with you and all of that yeah okay um so dervishknives.com is my website it's a little outdated it's not you know there's i haven't really uh kept it up to date in the last couple of years but uh that's a good starting point and you're probably going to want to go on and, and uh sign up for my newsletter off the off the the homepage, and that way you'll be notified of coming projects when I have drops of mid tech knives, or if I have something coming up available. Um, and also, you know, follow me on uh, Insta- Instagram and Facebook. Yeah, Instagram, uh, I, I love it. So you can really actually just, I don't know, so visual, just see the pictures. I want that knife. Yeah, <laughs> buy the knife. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, John Gonzalez, uh, pleasure talking with you. Thank you so much for coming on and talking about der- dervish knives. Uh, I've been admiring your work for ages and I, I, I can't wait to, to see more of it. Oh, well, thank you. It was a real pleasure. Appreciate uh, it. You're listening to the Knife Junkie Podcast. Call the Knife Junkie at 724-466-4487 with your questions or comments. Back on episode number 108 of the Knife Junkie podcast, another great interview. That's what we do here on the Sunday show, or that's what Bob does on the weekend Sunday show. He gets a chance to talk to all of his heroes and wannabe heroes and uh, knife people he just wants to uh, have a great conversation with and let you eavesdrop in on that conversation. And another one today, Bob, with John Gonzalez from Dervish Knives. Yeah, I loved hearing about his evolution into what he's doing now. You know, first it was making a website for a knife maker and then it was uh having his designs made by the knife maker and then it was him learning by the knife maker and and then eventually you know he becomes his own full-time yeah, knife maker right. and 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 owner of dervish and and uh, i like seeing that progression it makes it seem um like a doable thing and of course uh he's used to the artistic exploration learning new skills and 
to me, it's a it's an easy jump in from art, you know, especially if you have any background in sculpture, right. or whatever, into knife making. And I like seeing that evolution. And then also, uh, uh, after we cut and we were just chatting afterward, he uh, he showed off the new run of Ursa Majors, which is that that sort of uh, copus modern copus style field knife that's got a 15 inch blade. And of course, you know, I'm like, oh my gosh, you know. As soon as I see it, you know, this is the brand new run, doesn't even have an edge yet. You know, I could sharpen this wedge for you. I'm like, oh, all right, we're going to have, this one's going to have to wait. But, uh, yeah, beautiful, beautiful work. But definitely on the list of knife junkie purchases <laughs> in the near future. Yes, it is. You know, I've been unfair to the fixed blades, Jim. I have a long list oh, of folders I want, yeah. but my fixed blade list is short, so this has to go on it. Wait a minute. What is, what is that I hear in the background? Bob, Bob, buy a fixed blade. Bob, yeah, Bob. <laughs> they're ho- they're hollering out for you. <laughs> I live a mythical life. All right. Well, if you are uh, wanting to get one of the Ursa Majors, as Bob is, uh, dervishknives.com is the website. You can find more information about uh, John and uh, everything he's got going on there at the website. And, Bob, finally, before we go, uh, anything else, quick takeaway, uh, other than wanting to buy <laughs> one, one of his knives? No, uh, just, you know, John was talking about how before he ever made a knife, he just ground and ground and ground and made a lot of like uh, missteps purposefully so that he could learn the craft. And to me, that was a good, uh, you know, whenever I get the chance to put steel to grinder, (laughs) you know, I don't have time to not try and make a knife. But I think maybe with a little bit of discipline and a little bit uh, of better scheduling, I could start doing something like that and, and just practicing you know, it's like practicing how to draw a head or hands. Right, you know, right. you, before you do your masterpiece painting, you do have to do that. You have to draw a million little hands in your sketchbook first. So, you know, maybe just going out there and grinding, not, you know, just to get a nice grind, not to get a nice knife is is a good approach. Practice makes perfect. As they say, you got to put in the time and the effort to, to for any craft that you want to do better in. Yes, sir. All right. That's going to wrap it up, episode number 108 of the Knife Junkie podcast. We definitely want to thank you for joining us and ask a favor. If you've enjoyed this podcast, please share it with a friend, theknifejunkie.com. They can find all the information about subscribing and or listen to the podcast right there on the website. So please share freely. For Bob, the Knife Junkie DeMarco, I'm Jim, the Knife Newbie Person, thanking you for listening to the Knife Junkie podcast. Thanks for listening to the Knife Junkie Podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please rate and review at reviewthepodcast.com. For show notes for today's episode, additional resources, and to listen to past episodes, visit our website, theknifejunkie.com. You can also watch our latest videos on YouTube at theknifejunkie.com slash YouTube. Check out some great knife photos on theknifejunkie.com slash Instagram, and join our Facebook group at theknifejunkie.com slash Facebook. And if you have a question or comment, email them to Bob at theknifejunkie.com or call our 24-7 listener line at 724-466-4487, and you may hear your comment or question answered on an upcoming episode of the Knife Junkie Podcast. Podcast.